All right. Um, hey, guys. So I'm going to do a quick intro, and then uh, Druba is going to talk a little bit. So I wanted to just introduce Druba. Druba has done a ton of stuff in his career. Um, the stuff he's going to talk about today uh, is his work that he did at Facebook, which many of you guys know and used. Um, obviously, there he helped build RocksDB. And since then, he has uh, started a little stealth mode uh, startup called Rockset, uh, where he is the CTO and co-founder. And now I'm going to hand it off to Druba. Okay. Cool. We'll have a little bit of time at the end, by the way, for questions. So think uh, during during the presentation about what you want to ask. Hey, thank you, Brian. So thanks a lot, uh, folks, for inviting me to talk to you today. Really appreciate it. Uh, it's always great to talk to users of software that we have built, uh, because I always get like new insights and new feedback into how to make this system better. <clears throat> so um, today's talk, I have uh, some slide where uh, which I can cover, but I would rather take more questions from you. So if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand or just ask me a question. Even if I don't cover all my slides, that's fine, because I can share the slides with you later, uh, and you can still read it. I would rather like this talk to be more you know, like a discussion format rather than a one-sided thing. Sounds good? Uh, just a little bit introduction about myself. Uh, I've been in the Valley for a long time, uh, maybe like 25 years or so, uh, writing different kinds of software. Started time when there was no cloud, uh, and mostly writing like product software. Uh, but the last two projects that I have done are on open source, so I have built a lot of open source software in the last two years, or last 12 years, uh, starting from HDFS, the Hadoop file system, which I helped build when I was at Facebook, uh, when I was at Yahoo. And then uh, RocksDB, which was uh, when I was at, at, at Facebook. <clears throat> uh, right now, I am in a stealth mode startup. So I left Facebook around uh, a year and a half back um, and uh, just trying to do something more on the cloud platform um, and something that I can't talk about much today. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so a little bit background about RocksDB. Some people sometimes ask me, like, why did you decide to do RocksDB? And like, what was the motivation factor? So if you look at uh, like so 2010 or some time around that, uh, we used to have disk subsystems uh, where we used to store all our data. When I'm talking we, that means at Facebook, because that's where I used to work there. So we used to store a lot of data on disks. And if you see like the approximate times of network round trip and, milli and disk latencies, that's like 10 milliseconds versus 50 microseconds. Right? Uh, again, these numbers could be different from your network, but I just wanted to give you a relative perspective of how different they are. Uh, so the database servers never really cared like, about the network round trip because most of the time is taken accessing your data from the disks. So if your application is sitting here, it doesn't really care whether the database is very close to it or very far away from it because most of the time is in the 10 millisecond latencies of fetching data from the disk. Uh, this is when disks were, at, were attached to the database servers, right? In 2010, Facebook moved a lot of their database servers to SSDs. And so now you can see the difference in latencies where SSD accesses are like, say, hundreds of microseconds. And so now the network latencies become uh, maybe 50% of your total work, of your total latency, because you spend 50 microseconds here and 100 microseconds getting data from SSD. Uh, so the difference in my mind at that time was kind of uh, kind of um, getting clear, saying that, hey, maybe we should build an embedded database which runs close to where the application is. Uh, so if you remove the disks and the database server from there and then move it here directly to the application server. So this is my uh, thesis at the time. There are disadvantages to this because you might not be able to ship database code and application code differently, right? So there are disadvantages to this. But if you're looking only at performance, this is kind of um, really good because the application server can directly as access your database. So this is why I, was, I thought that we should, I should build an embedded database. <clears throat> uh, it, was a, it, it, was a, uh, it was a project that I started just because my manager gave me like leeway saying that, hey, go see if this works. 
somebody asked me today, like, how did you make this work, or how did you get started? It, there wasn't a grand plan or scheme of things saying that, oh, this is going to be the next biggest thing on Earth. Uh, same thing I remember when I joined Yahoo and I was doing the Hadoop file system. There was one intern who was working in the Yahoo indexing team. And he was the only guy I was working with. And nobody actually bothered anything about us. They just left us alone. They said, oh, these guys, we don't know what they're doing. Just let them be. Um, so there was no grand plan of things in many of these open source system development. Because these infrastructure development sometimes takes like five years before it becomes a really full-fledged product. <clears throat> um, so, so because of uh, these embedded databases, this is how RocksDB was born in my mind. Uh, so what we needed was that a key value persistent store, which is what RocksDB is, and then it's embedded. And we want to optimize it for fast storage, which means that we want a system or a key value store which can work well when data is stored on disks, oh, on SSDs, or RAM. So that was the focus of the project. Um, and then, obviously, server workloads, which means that we run it on machines which have probably 8 or 16 cores. <clears throat> yeah, makes sense? Any questions so far? <clears throat> uh, so RocksDB, it's definitely uh, not, it, it is not a distributed system. So it's a key values C++ library. Have any of you used RocksDB? I think I know some people who use RocksDB. Yeah, so RocksDB is a C++ library. So it's not really a, like a database in the sense of database management system. So there's no distributed, no failover, and it's not highly available. So if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if your data or your SSD catches fire, you lose all your data unless you do your application yourself. So in your use cases that you use RocksDB, probably you already have some mechanism to replicate data from one node to another. Yeah? <clears throat> OK. Uh, and the focus, again, was on single node performance. Um, so just to bring everybody up to speed, so key, the, the basic abstract is that keys and values. And keys and values are byte strings. There's no like schema, or it's not like an SQL schema database where you have types of um, of records, and data is sorted stored by key. So all your data, your entire database is basically a sorted uh, list of keys, uh, and the operations are put, delete, and merge. Um, so puts are when you add new data to the system, deletes are when you delete a key, and merge is an operation that I can explain more which essentially lets you avoid read, modify, writes, and implement kind of Redis lists and those kinds of advanced data structures. So there are three types of uh, records that the system knows about internally. Uh, and the queries are only two types. It's get, which means that given a key, fetch the value, and iterate or a scan. So given a key, give me the values and go to the next key. So those are the only two operations for reading. There are many other operations that we added over time, but that's the basic. Uh, so the log structured merge engine, uh, so the so RocksDB is a log structured merge engine, which is different from a traditional B3 um, database. The log structured merge architecture works this way. So a write request comes from the application. Uh, the, the, the database has an in-memory copy of this data in RAM. It's called the mem table or the mem cache. So basically, write this record into in 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 memory piece of uh, data structure, and also write it to a transaction log. So that's what happens when you have a write. So all writes go to a memory a memory buffer and to the transaction log. And then now obviously, this memory buffer will fill up after some time, right? So you can't just keep writing everything to memory. So at that time, you sort those memory buffers and write it to files in SSD or disk. So essentially, these get copied over into storage systems. And then you periodically compact these files so that uh, you can keep this under reasonable space amplification, which means that you don't just run out of disk space, uh, because that's the reason why you need to compact. Any questions so far? Uh, I can tell you how it kind of works for RocksDB in particular. So that's the general purpose LSM engine. So a write request comes in. It writes to an active mem table, which is on top. And then, like I said, the write goes to a transaction log. So once this active mem table is full, uh, this goes to become a read-only mem table. 
and new writes go to new active mem tables. So I think you were asking me like the differences from what we did in the very early days from level DB, right? So this was like pipeline writes because there are disk disk subsystems where we wanted to have a pipeline of writes to these disks because the disks were taking time. <clears throat> Whereas level DB had only like one active mem table. Uh, so these mem tables get flushed to new files on the storage, which are called SST files. SST store stands for like uh, sorted, um, what is it called? Sorted trees? Sorted string table, yeah, SST files. They're the data files essentially, and then the logs that I mentioned here are, are essentially the transaction log. So it's append only writes to, those, to the transaction log. And <clears throat> for the reads, uh, now if you look at that architecture, the reads are problematic because when you do a read, you might have to look at many SST files to find where your key is, right? Which means that um, you have to have an efficient way of finding where your key is instead of looking at each and every SST file. And so we use Bloom filters to reduce the amount of I.O. Uh, so the Bloom filters, uh, in my mind, is a great invention just because it enables so many different types of technologies that use Bloom filters now. So using Bloom filters, you, you, you don't have to look at all the files to find your key. You can actually figure out which are the possible candidates, uh, which are the possible candidate SSD files that has your key, and you can look on only at those. <clears throat> uh, so the read code path is like this. So this is the write code path, writes coming in and getting stored in SSD files, and they get compacted. So when the read comes in, like a get for a key, it first looks at the active mem table. If the key is there, it gets it from there, because that's the most recent version of, version of the key. If it doesn't find, then it looks at all the read-only mem tables and sees if the keys are there, the key that we are looking for. And if it is not there, then we need to go look at all the SST files and find out if the key is there. The SST files are kind of partitioned by key ranges, so it's easy to find. But still, you might have to look at more than one SST file. And this is what I mean by read amplification uh, in the sense that when you're doing a read, you might have to do multiple reads on the storage to find where a key is. But that overhead is reduced because we have this implementation of blooms. Um, so using the bloom filters, we can actually narrow down the set of SST files where the key is. Yeah, makes sense? Any questions so far? Yeah, so the Bloom filters, uh, so every SST file has a Bloom block here, which is basically the Bloom filters for that SST. So when you are doing a get, uh, most databases we configure such that the Bloom filter block is in memory. But you can, you can configure it to not be in memory, and then it'll be paged into memory when it is needed. <coughs> uh, and then these, these things that we read for the read request, they actually get to something called the read-only block cache. So that in case you need to read the same key again, it fetches it from the block cache instead of going to find, instead of refining it in the SSD files. So this is mostly an optimization. Uh, it's again in a piece of memory that we have um, that basically caches for reads all the keys or some of the keys from your SSD files. Any questions so far? Yeah. Oh, yeah, good question. So the interesting thing in, in my mind in this LSM engine is that all these SSD files are read-only. Nobody updates SSD files. They just create new SSD files. Yeah. So the entire database is actually all read-only, except this part, which is the read-write part, that part. So this is a few megabytes, whereas your entire database could be, say, a terabyte of space, right? So. Um, so now your question about invalidating it. Invalidating is mostly a question when you get a read request. You don't really need to invalidate everything. You need to find the latest version of the key. So there is a way. So when the, when the request comes in, there is a way for us to figure out where, which files this, the latest version of the keys are. So we don't really like delete them. The only, the only time files get deleted is by this compaction process. <coughs> So that's another advantage of an LSM engine where you can kind of scale out just because most of your database is read-only. Yes, question? 
Oh, great, good, great question. So every database has many SSD files, right? And all the SSD files can share this block cache. And you can also make this block cache share SSD files from another database. So you can have, let's say in a machine you have four database instances, right? You can have one block cache, combined block cache for all the four instances. Uh, just because, again, you don't want to fragment. This is kind of the biggest piece of memory in your system. If your machine has 64 gig, you might want to give 60 gig to this guy uh, for mostly read intensive and low latency queries. <clears throat> so it is not fragmented, and you can share it among multiple database instances on the same machine. Question? Uh, yeah, so um, what happens is there are something called column families. I will let go. please hold on to this question for a second. When I talk about column families, then I'll explain how we can set different settings for different column families. Yeah, there are many other tunables based on levels. For example, um, the ratio between levels. You can set it for every level. By default, it's 10, which means that the lowest level has, let's say the topmost level is one byte, the next level will have 10 bytes. That's the default, but you could change it for every le level that you have. Um, block sizes and stuff like that, it's not really per level. Uh, it's mostly for the database, but you can change the block sizes and it is backward compatible. It's not going to recreate all the files. <clears throat> uh, again, the format for RocksDB, I think one of the big use cases or why RocksDB became very popular is because a lot of its parts are pluggable and adaptable and changeable, and they're well-defined APIs. So for example, the, 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 the way we write the transaction log, it's very customizable. So you can actually write it to your own customer transaction log. For example, Suppose you want to write a transaction log to, instead of local disk, you want to write it to Kafka or something else, some other systems that you have. You can very easily plug it in. Uh, the mem table format is very pluggable. By default, it's kind of a skip list, but you can have a vector mem table. You can have an array mem table uh, for mem table formats. For SSD formats also, it's quite pluggable. I can explain in a future slide how there are different types of SSD formats. The reason, again, is because of Facebook, there are like probably 50 different use cases that uses RocksDB. And to get their engineers who try to get the best performance out of the system. So this is the reason why a lot of things are pluggable. The defaults are a good choice. But if you really want to get a lot of mileage out of your hardware, you might want to experiment with different things. Um, <clears throat> take, for example, while logging. I remember uh, there was some people who were writing like a replication layer on top of RocksDB, right? Because RocksDB doesn't have replication. So what we did was, uh, this is the active mem table, that's the log. And when a write request comes in, you have put K1 and V1, and you also have an opaque parameter uh, that you can write to every transaction log entry. So it's kind of any opaque thing, any string byte that the database doesn't interpret. What the database does is, it writes this K1V1 to the mem table, but it puts this opaque thing to the log. So now there is a log replicator which reads from the log and tails it and then uploads some other cluster in a different um, like data center, for example. Uh, this is what I meant by customizable. You can actually piggyback a lot of extra data that helps you keep your upper level caches in your application layer consistent uh, because you can plug in anything there you want. <clears throat> There's more description about this. I try to kind of summarize some of these files. Uh, static sorted tables and all keys are sorted in the static sorted table. They're block-based format, which means that all the SSD files are broken up into individual blocks of, by default, 4K or 8K. Um, but you can have different SSD files can have different block sizes. Uh, the block-based format is mostly used on spinning disks and SSDs. And there is also a table called the plain table format, which is mostly used when data is on RAM. So if you're running RocksDB on RAMFS, 
A RAM FS is like a random re random access device, right? So you can you can actually configure the plane table format because it has less CPU overhead when you're using the plane table format. This is what I meant by a lot of pieces are pluggable, and when you run it on different hardware or different systems, you might want to configure these things differently. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Uh, okay, so the bloom filters. A uh, lot of people have asked me questions like, where do you exactly use the bloom filter? So that's why I created this slide. Um, so the blooms. So there are many database systems which actually have blooms on SSD files only. Whereas in RocksDB, we have blooms even on um, keys in the mem table, uh, because there are use cases. Again, this is configurable. Okay, by default it doesn't have it, but there are use cases where we had where our mem tables were big. And so looking up a uh, sorted uh, skip list was more CPU than using the Bloom first. So there is support for Bloom bits for mem tables too. And obviously, like standard database technologies nowadays, it has Blooms for SSDs. I wanted to mention this especially for use cases where you have where a lot of your data is in RAM or your active mem tables are very big in size. Uh, for those use cases, setting up enabling Blooms on mem tables might help reduce CPU cost. Um, <clears throat> uh, then about the mem table formats itself, uh, by default the mem table format is a sorted uh, is a skip list, but you could also have an unsorted mem table. And uh, what happens is when the write comes in, it just puts it into like a bag of memory, which is not sorted, uh, because you don't support reads from that mem table. So reads are only from data from SSDs, and this is used to bulk load systems, bulk load data into RocksDB. Take, for example, you have 100 gigabytes of data to upload, and nobody's querying RocksDB at that time. So you don't really need to do key by key insert and keep sorting it. Uh, just makes your system easy for bulk loading, for example. So in that case, you can configure it using an unsorted mem table. Does it make sense? Yeah, question? Yes, same as vector mem table, right. <clears throat> Basically, it's a vector of memory bytes. Um, Okay, column families. So this was another thing that we uh, kind of enabled very early on when we tried to put rocks to be in production. Uh, there were use cases where people were storing two different types of data in the same rocks to be instance, and these type of data needed different compaction strategies or different block sizes. Take for example, uh, people are storing say user user information and then. Um, his friend list or something like that, so which is much bigger than, say, the user information, right? So there, I'm just giving some dumb examples, maybe, but basically two different types of data that you need to store in the same database. Mm. And the reason they need to store in the same database is because they want to use atomic writes so that both the keys are there or none of the keys are there, right? You can't store it on two different databases. So column families, what they do is they behave like exactly two different databases, except that the transaction log is shared. Uh, which means that they give you atomic reads uh, or atomic writes for these databases. So you could configure this uh, column family saying that um, I want to, I have, you could also put this column family entirely on disk and that column family entirely on SSDs, for example. Uh, you could have completely different block sizes and key values on these two different, um, different uh, column families. Uh, but it shares the same transaction log so that if the database crashes, you, you the consistency between the data that you inserted between those two things are still maintained. Um, the write ahead log, um, people also ask me questions about like what kind of durability does RocksDB provide? Do you lose data like just because you have not configured it correctly? So uh, there are features where there are configurations in RocksDB which lets you do like three different modes of um, durability. So if you say disable wall equal to true, that means there's no write ahead log, uh, which means that obviously write amplification is reduced because you're not writing the write ahead log. But on the other hand, if your machine dies, obviously you lose all the data that is in the mem table. Uh, so, so for some use cases, it might be okay. Um, and then there is an option where you can say sync equal to false. Uh, for every write, and what it does is uh, it basically flushes the transaction log to the OS, uh, which means that if your process dies, you still get your data back, 
Uh, but if the machine dies, you might not get the last few minutes of writes. Uh, and then there's one more option, which is sync equal, equal to true, which means that every time RocksDB writes to the transaction log, it flushes and syncs the transaction log to stable storage so that you'll get all your data back, even if you crash, uh, which means the latency might be higher here. Uh, latency will be lower here. Uh, and here, there'll be far less. Your write amplification will be reduced by one because you're not writing the transaction log at all. <clears throat> and I've seen all the three modes being used at Facebook by three different use cases just because they needed different kinds of reliability and durability. Uh, <clears throat> then that's as far as writing the transaction log. Now for reading the transaction log, again, there are like three different ways of reading it. Uh, one option is that you can say that I want to make sure that when the database restarts, it re like gathers all the data from the transaction log and applies it. And if it cannot apply it because of some reason, because the disk is corrupted, it should throw an error and say, sorry, I can't open the database. You have to manually fix it. Uh, that's the default mode. Uh, then there is another mode where you say recover all the data except the last record. If the last record in your transaction log is corrupted, that's fine, so ignore it and carry on. It's possible because the system might have crashed just when you're writing the last record. Mm, and then there are other options which say that recover up to the first corrupted record in your transaction log, uh, and then ignore all the remainder of the transaction log. Again, these, these cases are needed when you have different failure modes on the hardware that you are using. Mm. And then recover all valid records, which is basically um, try your best. Skip over corrupted records and f recover as much as you can. Uh, the reason I pointed out here is that this is what I meant by saying some people have complained, saying that uh, oh, RocksDB is very complicated to, to use. And I kind of agree because there are too many uh, tunables. There are some good defaults. For example, here, uh, this is the default recover all except the last wall record. That's the default in the system if you don't tune it. But you need to know these things in case you need to use it in a different way. Any questions so far? Uh, so the block cache, I think I already mentioned it is used only for reads. And uh, it's the block cache also is sharded, which means that uh, the block cache um, has locks on it, obviously, but they're the sharded lock system. So by default, I think it's sharded 64 ways, uh, which means that if you're running it on a 16-core machine, most likely you won't have too much lock contention when you're using the block cache. It's default sharded, so you don't have to do anything. Uh, index and filter blocks are uh, can be configured to remain in the cache. I think somebody asked me this question just now. Yeah. So by default, it doesn't remain in the block cache, but you can configure it to be part of the block cache, in which case, when it's needed, it is going to be fetched from the SSD files. And the block cache can also be compressed or uncompressed, uh, depending on if you have a lot of CPU to use, then you can probably keep it compressed. Otherwise, the block cache is uh, only delta encoded and not compressed. Any questions? Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, you can think about it as all the keys are sorted in an SSD file. But let's say the keys are, say, 1 to 100, right? And there are like 10 blocks. So when somebody is looking for key number 50, uh, we need to be able to do a binary search on these blocks. So there is a, there is a block at the bottom of every SSD file, which has the starting key and the ending key of each block. So that's what I meant by the index block. Um, <clears throat> so the block cache is very much pluggable. You can write your own code, code to implement a better block cache if you want. It's a very well-defined API. The default ones is an LRU cache. Uh, somebody recently contributed a clock cache, uh, which is basically the clock algorithm, so it might work better for some use cases. Um, and it's, like I said, it's shared by multiple databases within the same process. Uh, that's a key feature that sometimes people don't use, but I think you should probably use it just because you reduce the fragmentation of your memory when you use that feature, if you have multiple databases on the same machine. <clears throat> Do you guys use multiple databases on the same machine? Probably some use cases, OK. Uh, compaction filter. <clears throat> so 
Compaction is a process where RocksDB takes multiple SSD files and makes a single SSD file or a few SSD files, right? So uh, the compaction filter is, again, user-specified code. You can actually run your own code when the database is compacting. Uh, and that code can actually drop keys. So as part of your code, you can say that I don't want these keys anymore. So as part of compaction, those keys will get removed automatically. So also things like um, the compaction filter code can be in C++ or Lua now. So you can write code both ways. And a very useful um, functionality, the first functionality was a TTL for database records. So if you specify a TTL in your database record, there's a compaction filter. When it's, when it's compacting the database, it knows that, oh, this record, it's time for this record to go away because it has expired its 24 hours of time to live, and it automatically drops it. So an application doesn't have to constantly keep scanning the database and deleting actively records that it doesn't want. There are many other uh, higher level functionality that's used, that's designed, that's been implemented by other people not RocksDB developers using the compaction filter. I don't know if, if you guys uh, have like any TTL kind of functionality, functionality, then you can probably use some of this. Yes? Uh, yeah, I mean, the TTL has, the value of the TTL has no uh, problem. It's just you need to have space in your storage system to store two years of data. Otherwise, there's no problem. <coughs> yes? Oh, good question. So there is a there is a there is a thing which says that in the earlier versions of this code, uh, there are certain uh, files in your bottommost level in your tree which might not get compacted because nobody's overriding any of these keys. Uh, so that used to be a problem earlier. Now there is a fix which says that you can configure something which saying which says that I'm going to do a full compaction once every one month, or you can specify a time. Uh, so you are guaranteed that your keys will go away after some higher level or some coarser granularity. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, filter to modify values are useful uh, when sometimes uh, you want to drop uh, values or you want to compact values. Uh, take, for example, um, you want to do some kind of, let's say your key and you have 10 values, one for every week. And after some time, you want to assort them and make it smaller, the value size. Um, you can actually use it. Facebook uses, Facebook, there is one use case where the value used to be a long linked list, and the linked list keeps shrinking in time because they don't need to keep data in so much fine granularity when the data becomes very old. Does it make sense? Uh, so that's the compaction filter. Uh, and then there is another uh, pluggable thing that developers typically leverage is something called the merge records. So merge records are, mm, instead of doing a put, you write a merge record. Instead of writing a put record, you write a merge record into the database. And the database knows that this merge record needs to be merged with previous versions of this merge record. And it merges it using your code that you specify using a merge operator. So this is, uh, let me explain it, how it's used. Then maybe it's easier for me to explain. Um, so it is used mostly, say, for counter updates, right? So there was a use case uh, where we were measuring how many times people are clicking on an URL. And uh, uh, that's a counter. And we are using HBase very early on. And so that's every read is like you read the old value of the counter, and then you add one to it, and then you write it back. So for RocksDB, they implemented it using merge records which means that you just write a merge record with a value of one every time you see a click. And then you specify a merge operator saying that this is how you assort multiple merge records into one merge record by adding them up. Uh, and I remember like a 500 node HBase cluster, which was doing counter updates, got replaced with a 32 node RocksDB cluster at that time. This was like 2012 or something, or 2013. Uh, so HBase must have improved a lot. So I'm not trying to say bad things about HBase. It's just that at that time, this was a very powerful feature that we developed. It basically eliminates read, modify writes on your database. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there is more complicated ones. Some of these merge operators could be associative merge just because depending on your 
uh, on your data data structures. Like if it is a linked list, it could be very easy to do. Uh, you should read up on associative merge and generic merge if you plan to use it. Um, <clears throat> There are also good ways to add external tables to RocksDB now. This is a new feature that has gone in the last one year. Uh, so there are times when we have a lot of data like pending in Hadoop systems and we want to put it in RocksDB. So what we do is we create SST files in Hadoop itself. And the day there's a, the, the Hadoop, like a MapReduce job, it can actually create an SST file. And then we take that SST file and add it to uh, RocksDB by using an, uh, a new API called add SST file. So what it does, it basically takes all the keys in the SST file and just plops it into the database. Um, it's a very good way to kind of bulk import data from HBase or Hadoop systems. Yes? Yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, yeah. So the question is, how does it interact with uh, keys that are already in the database, right? Because now we have a whole bunch of keys suddenly getting inserted. So there are two modes of adding these keys. Let me, oops, uh, let me uh, explain you the last point. So what happens is that every record in the database, um, this is the interesting part, is that every record in this file gets added as if it was the oldest keys in the database, which means that if there are newer versions of these keys, the thing that you added in the file won't be visible in the keys. Does it make sense? That's one operation. That's oldest, or you can add it as the most recent version, which means that it it will appear as if you added these hundred thousand keys in one shot into the database, and that's the latest version of those keys. So there are only these two modes. You can't really insert somewhere in the middle of your of your like sequence number space. Does it does it answer your question? Uh, yeah, the, the insertion is constant time because it is just a file name swap. So the file actually is, it's not like we take, read every key from the thing and insert it. We basically take the whole key and swap it into the database. But those keys would, will appear either as if they have just been inserted into the database or they would appear as if they were the earliest keys. So if you had overwritten some of these keys, those, those keys won't be visible anymore because the, the newer versions would, are the ones that will be visible. Yeah, question? Oh, yeah, excellent question. So there's an entry in the mem table. Which, yeah, OK. So how do you handle the case where uh, if there are mem table entries in the same, for the same key range? So we actually look at the mem table entry, and then we flush the mem table to disk um, so that it, your version becomes the latest version. And you can also do this on an online database. So like you don't have to shut down your database to do this work. Am I running out of time? I couldn't see a clock, so I wasn't sure how I was doing. OK. Uh, so compression option and storage. Um, what are the different ways to compress data? Uh, this became a very um, crucial question because most of the data was on Flash. And so if we can optimize space on Flash, that's a big cost and money savings for us. Uh, and so the compression by default is it's per block. Uh, so you can configure different block sizes. You can say block size is 4K or 8K or 16K or even like 64K bigger size blocks. So you get more compression if your block size is bigger. But on the other hand, your random read performance might not be great because for every random read, now you need to fetch 64 kilobytes from the storage. Yeah, so you'd have to tr trade off this based on your own um, uh, own workload. Uh, and again, the compression algorithm is very much pluggable. So if there are newer compression algorithms people have in mind, it's very easy to plug it into the system. Um, the, by default, these are the s ones that are supported by the system. Snappy is what came with LevelDB. Um, uh, Zlib and LZ4. Oh, the Z is missing. Yeah, Zlib and LZ4 are also widely used. ZSTD is a new one that got added recently. Um, so ZSTD essentially gives you um, almost as fast compression as Snappy, um, but the sizes that it creates is far better than what Snappy does. So you can take a look to see. Uh, there's widely published benchmarks. So now a lot of Facebook database data stores have moved on to ZSTD. 
Uh, and also, there's a, another mode uh, which you can configure. You can have a dictionary for the whole SSD file. See, I said compression is per block, uh, but typically um, different blocks might have still shared like strings and objects. So it's good to have a dictionary for the whole SSD file. Uh, so there is an option now that you can specify the dictionary size, and the dictionary is being it create. It gets created when you create the SSD file as part of compaction. That's a useful feature. Uh, I have seen that quite useful, especially when somebody was asking me about inverted indices, uh, because some of those text things uh, really are the same text fields in different blocks. And so if you use a dictionary per SST file, I have seen a lot of significant space saving. Uh, and then the dictionary size is configurable. Uh, again, RocksDB is optimized for short range scans. What does it mean? Um, so there are lots of use cases we have seen where a uh, lot of uh, applications just seek to one key and then they want to fetch the next 50 keys. A very typical use case in Facebook, like find me uh, my f top 100 friends, for example, right? Or find me the top or the latest pictures that I have seen, the only the last 10 pictures that I have seen. So all of those are very short range scans. Um, and so we have optimized RocksDB for kind of uh, short range scans. Um, especially range scans which have the same key prefix. Uh, so we have organized this data so that the key prefix remains the same, and we can do quick range scans on key, key prefixes. Uh, we have also now blooms for prefix. So typically, LSM engines don't have great support for, um, don't really use blooms when you are doing scans, because there's no, no way to use blooms. Uh, for RocksDB, what we have done is you can create blooms per prefix instead of per key. So now you can actually leverage blooms for short range scans. And that was also a very powerful feature to reduce read amplification. Does it make sense? Uh, <clears throat> so a little bit, um, if I step back, uh, the development started in 2012 uh, of this. And 2013 is when we open sourced it. Uh, there were only probably three use cases at Facebook, three or four use cases at Facebook in 2013 when we open sourced it. And, but it's only after the open sourcing is when we saw a real lot of adoption by different uh, people. Uh, one of the first uh, teams that I worked with to see if it is usable outside of Facebook was LinkedIn. Uh, they kind of rewrote a lot of their feed infrastructure based on uh, RocksDB at the time. Uh, then Microsoft Bing uses RocksDB just for their Bing platform. And then a plethora of other storage systems. <coughs> mm. There is an iOS and Android port. I don't know how many people are using it. Uh, it's called RocksDB Lite. So when you build it with the RocksDB Lite flag, you actually get a much smaller um, shared library that you can use on Android um, and iOS too. Uh, but it's not used inside of Facebook. So I don't really know how great it is or how popular it is. Uh, and then, of course, MySQL and MongoDB storage engines. Do you want to hear a little bit about the MySQL story, how it moved to to to, to RocksDB instead of InnoDB? I have probably a slide. Uh, so yeah, so uh, the first experiment, again, I think 2014, is when we looked at uh, MongoDB. MongoDB was used by a system called Parse that Facebook acquired. And Parse was a big user of MongoDB, and there was like terabytes of storage when you put it in. MongoDB with the RocksDB storage engine, it was reduced to like 285 85 gigabytes. So a huge difference at that time. MongoDB has improved a lot since then. Uh, this is not going to be five terabytes anymore because this is what puts pressure on like commercial vendors saying that, hey, look, we need to make things better. Um, so there is a RocksDB storage engine inside MongoDB. So when you run MongoDB, you can actually say, hey, I want to store RocksDB inside it or store it in RocksDB database. Uh, similarly, RocksDB storage engine for MySQL. So Facebook uses MySQL a lot. Uh, this is where the Facebook graph is stored. Uh, and so it's like basically real-time uh, queries, um, key values, and again, short range scans. And uh, uh, there is a benchmark called LinkBench, which basically replicates the Facebook graph workload. Uh, it's an open source benchmark. And then when you run it on benchmarks, uh, we see that the size of the database is far smaller than RocksDB. So this is the benchmark that really convinced a lot of people at Facebook saying that, hey, we should use 
we should evaluate RocksDB to see if we can use it for our graph database. This is not the decision point. This was mostly a trigger for people to think that, okay, if we reduce the cost by 50%, what are we giving up? Are we giving up on like read latency or are we giving up on write amplification or something else, right? But people started to investigate this and then very quickly saw that even write latencies are actually better because we write far fewer bytes to disk. So there were side effects. And again, this, is, this didn't happen for free. There was lots of work by the RocksDB team to make this happen. There were like eight or nine people working on this to make sure that we can be far better than InnoDB at the time. Um, <clears throat> we can also forget about this one for a second. Uh, some more theories. Uh, so the two features that uh, that essentially MySQL needed for RocksDB are uh, transaction support. So these are two features that RocksDB has built. One is optimistic transactions and one is pessimistic. So optimistic transaction, the way it works is uh, it basically gets a list of keys that you are that your transaction is touching, and when you say commit, it verifies that you have not actually modified any of these keys. Um, and if you modify it, then the transaction will fail. Uh, not a great system, but it was mostly a proof of concept at the time. Uh, now we also have pessimistic transactions, which is what is used by MySQL. Um, so again, for MySQL, what happens is that we, we at Facebook use MySQL because uh, MySQL has replication support, MySQL has great uh, backup support, and we have like 20 or 30 database engineers who know MySQL very well as far as operations is concerned, right? So we can't really move our whole graph database to a new, brand new system we'll called RocksDB, which, which you have to build all these things from scratch. So we kind of try to get the best of both worlds. We put RocksDB inside the MySQL wrapper so that operations and everything remains the same, except that MySQL, instead of using InnoDB, they use RocksDB storage engine. So that's, again, an open source product, and I think Pinterest or somebody else also uses it, I think, now. Uh, for storing some of their graph database. Um, but it is supported by Parcona and MariaDB and other database vendors now. Um, I can tell you more about MySQL after this if you have more questions. I didn't focus much on the MySQL side of the story, uh, but that's kind of a very powerful story because that's kind of the crown jewel for the rocks for Facebook data store, which needs durability as well as availability and latency. Yeah, I think uh, Facebook, uh, the graph database is probably like in double digit uh, petabytes. So it is very difficult uh, to kind of migrate it. And there's a lot of process that I can talk to you after this. Yeah, sure, sure. Any other questions? Uh, iteration means like scan. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, excellent question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question again is that how does Bloom filters work with prefix scans? Uh, so, what happens is that uh, if you, in a traditional key value store, you can have an operation calling seek to a key and then call next, next, next. So it keeps on going to the next because all the data is sorted, right? So in prefix scan, what you do is that you call a seek, but you specify a prefix, which means that it goes to the first key, which has that prefix. And then you can keep calling next, but it will give you keys only with the same prefix. So once you run out of keys with the same prefix, it doesn't give you anything. So it's the end of the iteration. So that's the difference between prefix scans and normal scans. Normal scans will keep going till the end of the database. Whereas prefix scans, you can scan keys only with that same prefix. And so now the bloom filters, instead of having a bloom per key, we have a bloom per prefix. So when somebody says, I want to scan this prefix, and I use the bloom filter, I can quickly check that out of my 20 SST files, 19 SST files doesn't have this prefix. So I don't have to read them. That's the optimization. Oh, no. So, so no. So the prefix, uh, so the, the way you do it, you write some code which says that this is how I extract my prefix from my keys. 
You can also say that there are also some fixed ones. You can say my prefix is the first 10 bytes of every key. Those are the simple algorithms, but it's pluggable. Like you can say that uh, the, the database is going to call into your code saying that given this key, what is its prefix? And you return the prefix as part of the pluggable code. So people at Facebook, they will, just, they will put some, say, user ID, friend ID, something else concatenated, concatenated into one key. And so some of those are fixed ones. Some of them are variable size. Yes, correct, correct. So that's the standard iteration process. Yeah, there's a heap. And then that iteration code is actually pretty complicated now. Uh, because it needs to iterate with different SST files with key overlaps and sequence number overlaps. And also, RocksDB has something called snapshots that I didn't talk about much. So you can have a snapshot, which is basically any point in time uh, snapshot of the, of the database. So if you have a snapshot, you cannot compact across snapshots because you'll lose the consistency of a snapshot. So that code is quite complicated now. Um, Uh, is Bloom filters more efficient than range index? Yeah. Um, yeah, range indexes are here. I mean, range indexes don't tell you whether the key is in the file or not. It tells you that a key, if you're looking for a key and it fits the index, you have to go open the file and check inside it. Uh, so the index needs less memory. The Bloom filters need more memory. But you have absolute guarantee that your key is not in this file. So, you have a question? Yeah, it's kind of controversial where you take uh, that mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is, um, there is a, yeah, so there is, the question is that how do you handle deletes? Because tombstones might actually cause uh, inefficiency in your LSM tree. So, there are two ways. Um, tombstone, so, the compaction process right now, it actually looks at the number of deletes uh, in a file and figures out if, it basically, it's, a, it's one more metric to figuring out which to compact first. That's one point. The second point is there is a new feature that got developed in the last year, which is about range deletes. So you can actually delete a bunch of keys using one delete key. So you don't have to delete each and every individual key. You can look range delete for RocksDB. There's a good wiki page now. Uh, that's the second one. And the third one that comes to my mind is something called single delete. So single delete is another optimization where you can use single delete if you know that a database already has only one version of the key. Suppose your application is such that you already know that there is always one version of your key, then you can use single delete and it'll remove the tomb tombstone right then and there as soon as it merges with the first record. So those are the three things. Maybe you can take a look and see if that helps. Question? No, I think Facebook, everything has moved to. No, no so as far as I know, probably around 80, 90% have already moved to uh, RocksDB. And there might be, so Facebook has something called the Facebook timeline, which is basically you can go to your timeline and then look at all your old things. Some of it still runs on disk, so I'm not sure whether that has moved to uh, RocksDB or not. But the focus of the whole company is to move everything to RocksDB. No, so there's a detailed uh, post now. You should look at the post from Yoshi. He's the guy who is handling the MyRox work. And he has a very detailed post on how RocksDB with, My with MySQL is better on all the fronts, not just one. So this is what I mentioned. Like in the beginning, it was mostly a size efficiency. And all of us thought that we'll not be able, we are giving up on something else. Uh, but for all the Facebook use cases now, because of the work of all the team of the RocksDB team is that it has improved on all three sides. Latency, write amplification, as well as size ampl size of the database. Um, I am not 100 percent sure about the use case on disk. Like I said, the timeline is still on disk, but um, I'll, I, I think if you poke around on the Google search, you probably find something there. Um, 
I think we have almost run out of time. So I can answer, help answer any other questions later if you have more things. Um, I think we are at time, but welcome to stay back so you can huddle around and ask questions. Let's give a round of applause to our speaker. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, welcome guys. to get food and then we'll hang out and you'll stay for sure, more yeah. questions. Thank you. Yeah. If there are any questions, I'm happy to like answer them. Yeah. Oh, that's another good question. Um, so I think the, all the benchmarks that we have done, it seems to me that you know, the values are around say 1K to 4K, the value size, is when you get um, RocksDB is better than InnoDB. If you're looking at value sizes where the values are very big, say 80K or more, then it's possible that there is right amplification that RocksDB is not the greatest solution for in those cases, so Facebook has this use case where Facebook uses something called memcache to store a lot of data, and memcache has a RocksDB uh, cache now because they want to extend the cache into SSDs. So memcache, uh, the key range is quite high, uh, quite uh, broad, but like I think 90 percentile use cases are more than 80k. Yeah, so for those use cases, uh, now RocksDB has a compaction mode. Uh, which is called blob store. So for this, the blob store mode reduces write amplification. Um, I didn't talk much about the blob store part yet, but again, like this basically because a big person, ten percent of the keys are more than ADK. Uh, so they instead of using level compaction, they use blob compaction. Um, and I think the sweet spot is the smaller the keys and values. The better, the more is the performance difference between Rocks DB and other systems. When the keys become or the values become bigger and bigger, then the performance difference might be lesser and lesser. Any other questions? You, you talked about um, using Rocks DB as a MySQL backend, but also as kind of using it as an individual in, in like individual services, um, storing specific service data. How do you decide between those two different modes? Of Oh, good question. I think so. When Facebook started, the only thing Facebook had was the Facebook graph, right? So this is 2006 or five. Um, they basically set up a sharded instance of MySQL, and said that user data, user posts, user likes will store here, right? So at that time, it was all about just storing and serving the user data. It's only I think 2008 or something when we, or 2009 when we started to think about monetizing this stuff. And this is when all the ancillary databases came up, saying that how can we figure out better ways of um, engaging people, uh, f people you may know, how can you, how can you improve a lot of your correlations between users, how can you show relevant posts for users, so like a relevance engine. So this is where you take the Facebook graph and then you crunch and put it in a different form, because that's the best way to serve those queries. And all these things are essentially ancillary databases that are very tightly coupled to the application, and they're embedded databases. Am I, am I making sense? So the source of truth is kind of the graph database, but that's not the one that you use to recommend the friends you, that, that you might like, for example, right? So you need to do a lot more processing. So all these things, these are, this is how I call as secondary indexing, but not at the database layer. It is more like secondary indexing for your applications. So like say, if, take for example, you want you go to a location and you want to find out all the photos taken by your friends at that location, yeah? So you don't pre-calculate all these things. You have to get it right then and there when I say check in. So this is what I meant by, and you don't need to get your latest data from your, from your graph database. It's okay if your, the data that you are serving for that type of query is say one hour old which means that now you need to build all these secondary indices and different ways of looking at the same data. And this is where RocksDB is used a lot. Uh, it's kind of similar to some of your search use cases, I think, uh, where you need kind of a different way to look at your same data set. Question from there? Uh, yeah, I think it was like a two-year effort uh, from the from the date it was decided that we should migrate all the stuff to
to the time now where it's like probably 80 or 90 percent migrated. Uh, the biggest issues, a um, lot of it was building systems and verifying them, like the backups are correct, and then how do you actually do replication? Is replication working well when you are running with RocksDB instead of InnoDB? Uh, then there is validation of data. So we have, at Facebook, we have a good way of shadowing our use cases. So what we do is that we take, so let's say we'll take these 20 MySQL boxes and say we'll shadow these MySQL boxes. So the same write traffic is going to uh, two places. And then when a read request comes, that read request is also going to go to both these places. And as part of the read code, which is basically HSVM or PHP, or just think about it just as the application process. It has... Um, uh, asynchronous ways of fetching data from the shadow and validating that the data is still the same. Uh, so it is not like a single team project. It's a multi-team project because lots of instrumentation has happened even in the PHP code or the, or the application code which can validate this shadowing of databases. And this did not happen. So the first time this was actually useful was um, I was in a project called Ubase, and I was trying to replace MySQL with HBase. I spent around nine months on that project, um, and this is when I, when other people in team helped build this shadowing framework. And then I, I stopped that project, saying this project cannot go much because HBase has a lot to catch up. And that's when I started to develop RocksDB. But yeah, there's the challenge in my mind is not the code; it's more about the deployment process and keeping it running without any corruption and without any big fire. I think it will be lesser. Uh, again, I think I would, I, I, I would caveat it with one thing. I, in my mind, I think what I see is that if you try to replace a system, the first thing we need I would be doing is to make sure that the people who are running the existing system are the guys who are doing the migration. This is more, um, how should I say, social engineering rather than some technical thing. It's a different team cannot be doing the migration because these are the guys who actually know how your system runs. And once they're convinced that your system is better, that is the time when you think that, okay, this project is going to be successful. If you put in five different people saying that, okay, we have this old system now, let the old people continue to run that system when the new five guys try to replace that system. That's very difficult in my mind. Um, just because of social engineering issues, it's kind of becomes you and me or uh, not easy to do. Um, so again, I think my the thing when I thought MyRox was going to be popular at Facebook was when like the 25 people, MySQL operations guys, said that yes, we are going to make this work. Then I knew that because they know MySQL inside out. They've been running it for like eight years. Um, and then the challenge was that for RocksDB itself, we basically became a slave. And they were the masters. They were sending us, you need to do this in RocksDB. You need to reduce write amplification. So you go do that stuff. And they do the integration and actually shadow it and test it. It's not us, like outsiders in my, I'm an outsider. I don't run, know how to run MySQL. <coughs> Oh, no. So the MySQL operations team is around 20. Okay. Yeah. So maybe like two guys are the guys who really worked on the migration. Um, so Facebook actually developed a lot of MySQL code. For example, MySQL InnoDB compression was done at Facebook. Earlier, InnoDB did not have compression. So there's a Facebook, one Facebook engineer did this. Uh, but none of the Facebook engineers who worked the InnoDB code, uh, they felt that it was very difficult to do compression well. Just because in a B tree, you'd have to like say it's an 8K page or a 16K page. It's not like flexible page size. So you have a lot of div fragmentation and you lose a lot of space. Uh, so there was one engineer who used to know uh, InnoDB code inside out, and the others were mostly like 
small time changes to InnoDB. Any other question? So uh, RocksDB is actually, there's an API to fetch metrics. Uh, the metrics are all, um, they're kind of lock-free metrics, all of them. Uh, but still there's an overhead. If you run that thing like many times a second, then I don't know how well it will be. But all those things have been changed to lock-free uh, data structures. So um, it depends on how frequently you access. Uh, the metrics also have like inbuilt histograms and stuff like that. So you can look at statistics.h, there's a header file. And that's the public facing API for RocksDB. Um, the way people consume these metrics are not directly using that API, but mostly uh, like Facebook has a scraper, right, which runs like metrics collections on every node. Uh, and RocksDB runs as part of, say, the search backend. So search has a like a gRPC or thrift or some other API that the collection, the metrics collection agent will pull, and then the server will fetch this from RocksDB and give it to the to the metrics database. Um, do you use any open source metrics things like Prometheus and all these new open source? No. Okay. You have a question. Uh, yeah, good question. The first thing I, uh, the, the first thing that I did was that the slave, a few slaves started to run my rocks. Uh, no, actually before that. So there are uh, MySQL instances that I used only for testing. Those were the first ones that got translated to my rocks. Uh, those are basically like the nightly tests and hourly tests and all that that they use. They go over there. Uh, they also run on normal MySQL boxes, but they also run on this. And then the second thing, again, the second big thing is that a lot of slaves, or like 80% of slaves, got migrated to MyRox. And as part of that, uh, there were two slaves and one master for those. And one of the slaves was MyRox. And two of the slaves were MyRox. And then uh, when the switchover happens, that's when the MyRox becomes the master. Um, this is what I meant by that this is all operations driven. Uh, they already had scripts to make slaves a master. Uh, when to make sure, they have to make sure the master is dead, they have to make sure that all the bin logs are replicated. So we still use, MyRox still uses bin logs, so it uses basically my MySQL replication mechanisms. Uh, um, I don't really know. I mean, I am sure we have run into it in the sense that uh, there's all new software, but I don't remember like one um, lightning strike or something. Uh, those all being part of the testing. Uh, yeah, I think I am not 100% accurate maybe, but probably around the MyRox database is around 20 petabytes. Um, and the request will be like billions in seconds, billions per second, I don't know how much. That's like, if you look at the tau, there's a paper called tau the Tau paper, which is basically the graph database for Facebook. Uh, there, I think there are some numbers, but those numbers are like four years old, so I really don't know what is a read request. Oh, outside of Facebook, um, you we have seen commercial support from Parcona now. So they actually support MySQL with MyRox. Uh, and I know one or two financial companies use it. Um, but I don't really know who else is using it. Uh, Percona has been pushing this a lot because they see a lot of uh, value add. And also because Facebook development team is quite big in RocksDB compared to the InnoDB development team now. So I think over time, things will just become more and more better. Um, 
Yeah, question? Yes, so absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I think uh, without batching, things don't work. So what happens is that if you do transactions from multiple threads, or I should not say transactions, if you're writing to the transaction log, they get batched up. So the batch writes the whole, the pending amount of transactions to their wall, and the other guys block there. And then when the transaction finishes, we free up all the transactions that have been committed. And then the next batch goes. Mm. So this is what I meant by saying the, the reads are highly scalable. So if you have eight CPUs, you get certain reads per second. If you use 16 CPUs, you probably get around close to twice the reads, which means reads are more or less linearly scalable. The writes are not linearly scalable, uh, which means that if you have eight CPUs, you are getting some amount of writes per second. If you add eight more CPUs, you won't get double the amount of writes. Mm, it's not linearly scalable. So there's more work to be done. The recent work that has gone in is that the writes to the transaction log and writes to the mem table are in parallel now. Uh, but I think there's a lot more work to be done to make writes go to some ungodly number. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, RocksDB reads portions of these files and puts it into, so the, every file is broken up into blocks. And so when you're looking for a key, RocksDB looks at the index and figures out which block to read, and then reads the block from the storage to the block cache. So basically, it's also map. No, it's not a map. So we have also, we, there's also an option to write, to do mapping, and you can benchmark it. Uh, but we don't use mapping for most of our use cases just because the performance is bad. Um, so yeah, you can do mappings also. Um, <coughs> um, what was I about to say? Mm. Yeah, so also um, uh, RocksDB uses F-advise calls to be able to manipulate the OS cache and make sure the OS cache is wisely used. Uh, things that are in the block cache that get removed from the OS cache, vice versa, depending on your config again. And the difference, though, is that the OS cache, the data is compressed, and the RocksDB block cache, the data is uncompressed. So you'd have to think about that when you try to see which cache is best. There are some use cases at Facebook who use only the OS cache and a very small block cache because they have a lot of data, and they want to keep it cached, and it fits in the OS cache. Um, but on the, there are some other use cases which wants really, really low latency, so they have very big block cache. Uh, so yeah, the question is, do we use ODirect? It's a new feature that has come in in the last one year. I believe there's only one use case that uses ODirect right now. Uh, so this code is definitely production ready, but I think we just need to do more. I mean, you whoever uses it needs to do a lot more testing than the other pieces of code. Yeah, you had a question? Okay, yeah, good question. So the block size is uh, configurable. You can say block size is 4K, 8K, 16K, whatever it is, but it's a heuristic, which means that if there are keys, so uh, unlike InnoDB, mm, if your key is, let's say you're filling up a block with keys and values, and the last value is maybe two bytes more than the block, right? So we are not going to put those two bytes in a different block. So the, it's actually every block in RocksDB is variable size. The size that is specified is just a heuristic, so you kind of keep it close to that size. Um, so if you have a value which is humongous, it will be one block with that value. Yeah. 
Yeah, so what will happen is that, let's say the block size is 4K, yeah? So now what will happen is that this is going, this is 4K is only heuristic. So let's say you have uh, 5,000 byte value. That 5,000 byte will be one block, and it'll be one read from, there'll be only one decompression entry for this. It will not be two blocks. So decompression will be only for, it'll be done only once. So the value never crosses multiple blocks. The block gets extended to the next value. Question? Yeah, I think uh, there are two options. So Facebook has an open source branch, um, which has uh, most of the MyRox changes. But uh, that is not the branch that most or the financial companies are using. They're using a branch from Parcona, which is basically a MySQL redistributor. And Parcona actually takes the, MyS the, the Facebook MySQL branch and actually puts it in MySQL. So I think in my mind, I think there are two options for a company like Dropbox. One obviously is to go talk to Percona. The other option would be to say that um, I will take the Facebook MySQL branch and then try to work with the Facebook developers and see if that, that is a faster process. Uh, in my mind, I think the, actually I don't know what, what, what will work better. Uh, this question hasn't arose before because I think the Pinterest guys, please don't quote me, please check yourself. I think they mostly go with Percona uh, because that's how their other MySQL boxes are also being used. They have support from Percona. Right. Right, yeah, I agree. Um, I can put you into in touch with the MySQL operations folks at Facebook. They, I think, will be able to give a better answer to this question rather than me. Yeah, I can do that. Please check with Brian, and I can, he can put me in contact, or Min, and he can put me in touch with you. Any other questions? Yeah, two things. Uh, one is write scalability, and the other one is tiered storage. Those are the two basic focus. Tiered storage is where uh, you have spinning disks and SSDs and NVMEs and RAM. So four kinds of storage systems on one node. So how can the database leverage this uh, and make sure the right things are in the right layers? Uh, so that's one focus. Again, because the databases are becoming bigger in size, uh, and putting everything in RAM or NVMe or even SSDs now is, is a cost factor. So that's one. And the second one is how can you do more writes? Um, the Facebook graph database is actually 99% reads and 1% writes. Um, so, but there are other use cases at Facebook that uses RocksDB where there are a lot of writes. <clears throat> so those are the two main focus of the team. Cool. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, keep in touch and let us know how we can help in any other way. Thanks.